Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our teaching. Father, we thank you for this time once again, for giving us this opportunity to come and come together and to study and learn from your word, God. And even as we learn, Lord, we pray that we be receptive to the leading of your Holy Spirit, that you will lead us, you will guide us, you will minister to us, Lord. We thank you. We open our hearts to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So before we go ahead, let's just uh, quickly uh, do a review of what we did yesterday. Uh, yesterday we talked about the survey phase. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're looking at a city, look at the dynamics of a city, try to understand the city. We looked at the example of uh, the Apostle Paul when he went to Philippi and also when he was at Athens. And there are many other examples where the apostle paul was able to uh you know minister to people by 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 getting a feel trying to understand and reason with the people understand uh you know the dynamics of the of that city or uh, and and we also saw the launch area it's very important to have a certain launch uh, an area in mind when you, where you want to launch your ministry so that could be um you know, some things that you can keep in mind is proximity, um, and that basically will be your your main church or your mother church, and then out of that can come many other congregations or many other locations. Um, and so today we look at chapter 10, which is the preparation phase. Right now, I, I think you may have heard this verse many times, uh, you know, preparation time is never wasted time. Uh, and and sometimes we may want to start our ministry and we are excited we heard from god we know that god is with us uh, but uh, you know we may try to jump the gun meaning we may try to just take two steps when you know we're only take, supposed to take one step so we may try to you know, do things quickly just so that we can achieve what we want to achieve now it's very important to let preparation time happen to take its course. Uh, and even as this preparation phase happens, uh, this is what a uh, few points that we'll study today. These are the pointers that we can uh, you know, begin to do during the preparation phase. Now, when it comes to preparation phase, uh, we can also think of it as offsite. Uh, and that we've already talked about, you go to uh, you know, you, you can be elsewhere, you can think about the place and uh, the dynamics, you read about the place, what is the economy, what are the people like, what are the demographics, all of that can be done online, right, uh, off-site. But this preparation phase where we uh, begin to launch the ministry uh, will typically happen on-site, right? So you've got to be there, uh, be at that location. So first point on when it comes to pre uh, the preparation phase now these are just pointers right it doesn't have to be this order that you have to do it uh, but you can you know you can see what works for you right uh, but these are some pointers that you can use when it comes to launching your own ministry one is the pre launch meetings right now usually what happens is uh, the the code search core planting team if it's good to have a team right uh, you begin to visit the site regularly regularly you either you see okay is there somebody's home close by you begin with a you know probably uh, a cell group meeting there uh, and then eventually you search for a place where you can uh, have the services right now this initial phase is 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 the phase before the launch right um, before the official launch now when it comes to uh, you know this this phase especially like a small group or you're you're just having worship and prayer in a certain place uh, it's very important to be led by the holy spirit because this phase can can be one year it can be six months it can be two months right it can be uh, the the timing not necessarily has to be one or two weeks or a year or six months. So uh, we need to be led by the Holy Spirit. So that God, even as we're getting together, you know our heart, we want to start a church here, we want to start a ministry, 
um, help us to launch at the right time, give us the right space, open the right door, uh, give us the wisdom to take the right step at the right time, right? Uh, now, when we do this, when we have these pre-launch meetings, the church planting team gets together and prays. Uh, there's worship. There's, uh, uh, you know, you, you get organized. So one of the things that you can do is also prayer walks around the neighborhood, around that place, um, just praying for people, praying that the Holy Spirit will minister to people, touch lives, change lives, houses will be blessed, uh, you know, families will be blessed, children will be blessed. Uh, you're just speaking, uh, you know, you're praying, you're speaking the things of God in that area. Right? Now, uh, here's the thing. Sometimes we may feel very, you know, inadequate, or we may feel very small. Hey, three people walking around this big city, uh, praying for the city. Remember, the Bible teaches us uh, the prayers of a righteous man are effective, right? So our responsibility is to pray. And we can we can be just two people in a church planting team, uh, but it's good to pray. Good to pray and ask God to touch lives, to minister to people in and around that area. Right? The pre-launch meetings could happen for any period of time, like we said, three months, six months, even a year. Uh, but why we suggest not to you know, keep postponing it for too long is because uh, we may get comfortable doing what we're doing in that small setting, but you know, we, we should not lose the vision, right? So the reason of doing this small uh, pre-launch meeting is because one day we're going to launch, right? And if you feel that you're ready to launch, you can just go ahead and launch, right? So for example, when we started a location in another city, what we did was uh, we, one of the locations, we had these pre-launch meetings in one of our church members' house. Um, so it was weekly during the week, uh, not on a sat not on a Saturday, but during the week in the evenings. Uh, for six months, we had it. Right? We would go meet. We would uh, have worship, word, pray, pray for people in the neighborhood, pray for this for that area of uh, the city that people will, you know, uh, experience the presence of God and, and doors will be open. People looking for a church will come, uh, bless the outreach efforts, bless the church, even as you start the vision. So uh, so for six months, we did that. And after six months, uh, I remember, I think around the fourth or the fifth month, we began to look out for a place. And so we kept those two months. Okay, two months, we will look out for a place, you know, get the place, get the agreement signed, do everything, all everything that needs to be done in the practical, and then you have a uh, uh, launching of the Sunday service. So this is good to do uh, because what's happening is your one is you're keeping your church plant team, uh, you know, uh, you're keeping them informed of what the plan is. Two is there's unity, there's oneness. All of you are in one mind and uh, the foundation is good you spend time in prayer spend time in worship uh, and so you can you know go ahead and launch uh, next point is there may be some uh one-on-one -on -one evangelism and invitations that may be extended during these pre-launch meetings uh, but this period is primarily to strengthen the core team now uh when it comes to church i think one of the one of the uh, most of the pastors, right? Most of us as leaders, we we like to see a church with hundred, two hundred. We like to see a church growing, right? Nobody will want to say, okay, I want a church, and if, if I have hundred people, that's enough. Nobody would want that, right? You want to see the church grow. You want to see the church develop and become better and be efficient and grow in the spirit and and of course you want to see numbers being added, the people taking taken people from a place of you know uh, uh, not immaturity but uh, they're still babes in Christ you're taking them to a place you're they're spiritually growing in the Lord it's wonderful when when we see all of that happening but uh, but this pre-launch phase uh, it's always good to keep it for you know the team the core planning team Right. Uh, it's important that we don't spend all our pre-launch phase only doing outreaches. For example, you know, 
uh, evangelism, book uh, book distribution, Bible distribution, um, or uh, reaching out. I mean, it's good. It's good to reach out, but we don't spend all our time doing that. Why? Because we want uh, the, the the church planning team to be strong in in unity and um, you know that oneness to develop. So the prayer of all of them being together is very important. Of course, in maybe what you can do is if it's in a month, you can say, okay, two days or three days in a month, we will just spend the day reaching out, going for prayer walks, make teams, you can go out or or you can go one one by one like around the area. Uh, but primarily the pre-launch phase is for strengthening each other, strengthening the core team. Because later on, once the church has started, the church is growing, we need that oneness. You need that strength, that unity to be there together. right? So pre-launch meetings is something that you can think of. Another method would be the worship, prayer, and intercession. Right? Of course, in the pre-launch meeting, you will be doing worship, prayer, and intercession. Uh, and during this time, during the pre-launch meeting phase, you can have extended times. You can, as a team, you can spend more time. Uh, you know, if you normally spend one hour or two hours, you can try and spend you know three or four hours, right? A worship, prayer, interceding for people, interceding for families, uh, uh, for the city, for for working professionals. Just just being there and time spent in. This will is basically your foundation, because what you do in the beginning, when you know when you launch your church, when you launch your ministry, this becomes a habit. You know, having prayers, times of worship, times of intercession, times of extended times of maybe uh, you know days of fasting and prayer during the week, all of this is the foundation to a strong church. Right? Three, no your primary target audience and your other audiences right so identify your audience okay so for example you can look at okay number one we are starting an english church right so english church one now, now under english church okay so we need to reach out to English speaking students. So you look at English speaking English colleges, uh, then you look at corporate sectors, uh, or, and then you can also target, okay, married couples aged between 18 and 35. What can we do for them? Right? So know your target audience. Now, it's not necessary uh, that, you know, as a church, we have to have only one target audience. No, we can definitely, you know, reach out to everyone everyone are invited everyone it's the gospel is open to everyone right but there's there's this you know audience that god may have put in your heart right so for example uh, i remember uh, uh, you know in 2012 13 14 uh, well, up to about 15 16 we were doing a lot of outreaches right and even now we do but during those days it was even more Right, so we were, we were talking about Christmas carols uh, in apartment complexes, Christmas carols in uh, in malls across the city. So uh, that was wonderful. Then we would go into corporate sectors. Now these are uh, offices which had hundreds of people coming in to work. Right, so you have these uh, uh, you know these corporate offices. Right, uh, tech parks is what we call it here in Bangalore. Uh, tech parks. Right. different companies so we would go we would tell them hey can we do a christmas uh concert and and uh, give out some of our books and we would take permission so we did that for many years right uh, and it was wonderful because we were able to target people uh, and we knew okay all of them in a corporate sector will definitely know english so and they would definitely be uh, they would understand english as well and now many of them were from different age groups you had youth you had married young couples you had uh, people who are you know uh, almost in, in the early 40s as well so we knew okay that's the target there right so you got maybe 25 to 40 
or 45, right? So that 20 year range. So, so we know, okay, we are targeting this group of English speaking people, right? Uh, identify their needs, right? Identify ways to connect with your target audience. Now, one of the things we did when, when we were doing all of this was when, when we are invited to colleges, right? Uh, especially when we have to maybe do a, a teaching or you know, we get invited to do their, you know, a one hour of life skills or teaching. And then sometimes we we were also in, invited to, to do Christmas carols and youth concerts. So for example, right, there are, we are invited to a college. Now college, young people, 18 to 22, 23, all, all of them are between that or, or 16 to 23 or, right? Now, what kind of music will they listen to? They will want good music, right? They will. They don't want uh, the old songs, right? Uh, the old gospel songs, and no. So we knew, okay, the target audience is sixteen to about twenty-two years old. They want good music. I can't go with one guitar and stand there and sing. What are they? What is going to happen? It's not going to interest them. I, I won't be able to captivate them. Right? Of course, we're not trying by our own means, but these aspects are important. So what we did, we would begin to listen to new songs, right? Uh, the new different genres of music, of worship, of praise and worship songs. And we found out, hey, there are some good songs which we have to learn. And, and we were able to do concerts and uh, you know, uh, these are good songs, good praise and worship songs with God's word in it, uh, but they are, you know, contemporary songs. Right? So they were not some old songs, where, but the youth enjoyed it. And because they enjoyed it, we got called every year and say, why don't you come next year as well and minister to the students? And sometimes we also get invited to teach in colleges, right? So now if you're going to a college and teaching, we cannot start saying, okay, open the book of uh, you know, Deuteronomy and read this verse. It's not going to work. It's not going to help them, right? Always know the target audience. Okay, so they're young people. What are their problems? Depression, anxiety, fear of the future, addictions, um, uh, you know, uh, self-worth, uh, peer pressure. So these are the points, right? So we we made a curriculum. Okay, so when we go to colleges, these are the topics we're going to preach. So whenever we went to colleges, we had like a brochure. Okay, these are the topics: suicidal tendencies, drug addiction, overcome by overcoming bad habits, peer pressure, uh, and we would speak on those topics. Now, what's happening? Target audience, right? And what about in the corporate sector? Uh, if we were invited in the corporate sector, sometimes it's most of them are families, right? They're married with kids. How to manage work life balance? How to balance your work, balance family? You know, we, we may have, we may be excellent in our work, but not unable to do anything in the house. Right? Or we may be excellent in the house, unable to do anything outside of the house. So we need to maintain that work life balance. And then we understand the target audience. So when you are starting your church, or starting your ministry, and have target audiences. Now I'm not saying you have to have one audience only. No. So you know, okay, for the youth, this is what I'm going to do. For the middle-aged, 30 to 40, this is what I'm going to do. 40 to 60, this is what I'm going to. This is how I'm going to reach them. Right. Identify these ways to connect and with your target audience. Right. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 6, Jesus sent his disciples initially to minister only to the Jewish people. But Paul was sent to the Gentiles, while Peter was sent to the Jews. Now, why is this example here? Ministry in God's eyes is one thing. Right? When God looks at us as a church, he looks at one church. All these denominations don't matter to him. 
Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, doesn't matter to him. When the Lord Jesus looks, he looks at us as one church, as one body, washed by the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> so, Jesus chose Peter, go and preach to the Gentiles. Jesus said, sorry, uh, go and preach to the Jews. Jesus chose Paul, the apostle, and said, go and preach to the Gentiles. So, there will be times when God will, there will be a special anointing on your church or your ministry and your leaders to minister to a certain group of people. Right? That, that's a certain kind of anointing. God's call will be there, not only as individuals, but as a church community. Now, picture this. What if the Apostle Peter went out and spent more time with the Gentiles? God would have definitely blessed the ministry, but we see that when Paul spoke to the Gentiles, they just believed because he was also persecuted. But his work was much, much, much more fruitful than, than that with the Jews. But Peter's work was fruitful with the Jews. There's only, I think, a few accounts where Peter speaks to Gentiles. One is Cornelius. Right? Apart from that, I don't see any other place where you know he ministered. May have been a few instances elsewhere, but but you look at a look at Apostle Peter, Apostle Paul. Everywhere he ministered was to the Gentiles. So Paul himself testifies. He says, "You know, God has called me to preach to the Gentiles, to be a light to the Gentiles." So he knew that's his calling. So as a church, as a as a ministry. God will open doors where you, you know you feel okay. This is something that I can do. I know a couple of ministries which are, uh, you know, very powerful when it comes to ministering to uh, a prison ministry. They do really well because God has opened the doors. There's a, some kind of anointing there. They know that you no, know, there's God's favor. There's you know when they speak to the police officers. There's favor that God just opens doors for them. They are able to go minister to uh, people who are in prison. Then you have another ministry that I know of, uh, uh, not in this city, but in another city where uh, they minister to prostitutes in the red, red light area. Now, it's not easy to do that because you need permissions. One, you need the approval of the, the head of that prostitution ring. To he, That person must agree. So there are ministries which go in, preach the gospel, minister to you know these prostitutes. Who opens the doors? There's a there's an anointing. So when we know our target audience, it could be two or three, uh, you know, audiences. So the target could be two, three different kinds of communities. Now, but you come up with strategies for each of these places, right? Then identify people who God has already prepared. Right. So, for example, you start your ministry. Right. Let's read Matthew chapter 10, 11 through 14. So you get a context. Matthew chapter 10, 11 through 14. Right. So this is when Jesus is uh, sending out his 12 disciples. He's saying, OK, now you have seen me do the ministry. Now you go out. So 11 through 14, whatever town or village you enter, Jesus is giving the instructions. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greetings. But if, but if the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. Verse 14. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. Uh, yeah, that's still 14. So go where you are welcome. There will be times when your ministry, you may not even have even started the church, but people will call you to minister. Go where you're welcomed. Again, uh, you know, we must, as we learned last year in 
the ministry of the evangelist pastor and teacher we must understand that uh, whenever we are invited to places to minister there are certain guidelines we must follow but go where you're welcome minister wherever you uh, you go to right and now after your church is growing and people get to know your ministry people may invite you right now again as your church is growing as a as a pioneer as a leader of the church there are times you'll have to decline and and lovingly you can decline and there are times you can go minister to people now just because you decline uh, an invitation doesn't mean you don't like them doesn't mean they uh, you have something against them it's just that you're trying to focus on the church and the ministry that god has placed in your hand right look at this example in Acts 16 lydia uh, said come home said to paul come home and uh, in philippi come and pray and be with us and they went right we read this was lydia was a purple merchant who opened her heart god opened her heart she accepted the message of the apostle paul and lydia invited them home discern and avoid people with wrong motivations and intentions now there will be people who may invite you in terms of wrong motivation right so uh, there are many examples i can give but uh, you know i i don't know talk too much on that but there will be people who may invite you for wrong motivations right? just to gain a name or to gain uh, gain maybe financial needs or material things or uh, so you you discern that right you ask god you know should, is this something that i should do is this something that i should go and uh, you know take your time and think about it so always remember as a pioneer uh, you know you have the choice right uh, not you don't you you know the thing with pioneers and uh, ceos and businessmen uh, people who are leading ministries businesses they don't have to ask anybody anything they can do what they want to do but it's very important they have to be doubly sure that this is the right thing right because especially when it comes to ministry the ministry is not theirs it's god's they have to make sure that what they do is in line with god's word it's in line with what god has given them and you know god has uh, spoken to uh, so so that's very important right as a pioneer to think to discern right? now the next point would be after you have you know you have done your pre-launch you have spent time okay rosalind is saying will there be any authority where they will be submitted right now uh rosalind i'll i'll, I'll put it this way there are different denominations right so you got the denominational churches will always have a certain authority right uh, there's a hierarchy uh, but for example a non-denominational church a church which is pioneered by a person or a team a core team right it's most likely that they will be making all the decisions right so that is why initially uh, it's very important to involve your core team. The ministry may be yours. God has put the vision in your heart, but it's always good to have a core team. Now, I'm not saying that the core team will be with you 10 years, 15 years down the line. They may be there. If they are there, that's wonderful. That's great. But if they are not there, get the right team involved. Get the right people involved. Right? So, for example, uh, what we do at APC is... You know, when, whenever we get an idea, uh, so we put it out in the pastoral team, discuss it, say, okay, pros, cons, is it something that is doable? Is it something that uh, will bless the people? Is it beneficial for the ministry? What are the finances involved? Uh, and so we have a discussion together, right? And depending on the pros and cons, uh, and depending on now what what finances and all everything put putting everything under into consideration we make a decision right now we know that the church is pioneered by one person but we have a team 
right? Uh, and then when it comes to legal matters, finances, there's another team, right? So it, it's good to have a team, but I'm not saying that it's there in every church. Uh, now, when it's not there, it's a problem. Why? Because the the leader can make a decision and he himself, he or she may not know that whether it's a right decision or a wrong decision. But if he's got some people, a team with him, they may be able to, you know, correct and say, you know, hey, this is a better idea or or we can go ahead with this idea. So again, with denominations, there are uh, there is authority that they are submitted to, but uh, non-denominational church, it's very important to, you know, pioneers form a team, trust each other, uh, submit to, to each other, uh, you know, and, and when we do that, good decisions are made, wise decisions are made, so, yeah. But it's hard, right? Okay. Oh, Rosalind, you want to unmute and speak? Uh, uh, if you have anything else, yeah. okay. So uh, the question here is: What I've seen is one pioneer doing well successfully. Another senior man of God will approach him and ask him to submit to him because he was serving under that man of God before separating to follow his call. So like asking to send the tithes to him. Oh, that's a big no. So Rosalind, if, 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 okay, so Rosalind's question is, say there's a man, he was a person, uh, a believer, was working under a, a, a certain, was working in a church, and now he has moved out and started his own church, right? And uh, he started his own ministry, and this ministry is doing well. But the other church pastor comes and says, you have to submit to me, give him all the funds. And no, he doesn't have to do that. Remember what, uh, you know, in, in the book of Matthew, uh, Mark and Luke as well. When John the Baptist was there, Andrew and Andrew uh, was his disciple, right? What did Jesus, what did, what did John say? Go, go to him. Uh, he he must increase, I must decrease. So now when you look at it practically, Rosalind, God has called this person out. God is blessing his ministry. It is his ministry. It is his, you know, God has blessed him. And he, this other pastor, the other man of God, cannot ask him to give the tithes to him. If he does, how will he look after the church? He will not be able to look after the church. And he cannot do that. Right? All right. There's a season for all of us. There'll be times when we are working under somebody. There'll be times when God will take us and put us somewhere else. Right? Now, the right thing to do is this man of God must say, Hey, I will help you in anything that you need. And you know, or partner together, help each other to, you know, stand with each other. But asking them to send tithes, asking them to you know submit to his authority, that would be completely wrong. That's not biblical at all. So, thank you, Pastor. This, 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 I, I've been like seeing these kind of things around me. So, yeah, that's my question. Thank you, thank you for that. Yes, yes, and I think I think also in our nation of India, uh, it does happen because they've you know sometimes the. Uh, the ministry that that man of God who was there, you know, who started the ministry there, uh, may always feel that you know I am the one who made him spiritually strong because of me he's in ministry. Uh, but as believers, we must understand that it is not because of us. We may have trained people, right? We may have given them opportunities. We may have given them, uh, you know, opportunities and helped them, funded them, whatever we have done. If God has called them for another ministry, you should. We must be willing to let go of them, bless them, let them go, and let them be a fruitful to God's kingdom. Holding them back, taking control over them, is not a sign of a good leader at all. I, uh, I would say, I would question the, the authority, right? Because how can he say that? That means he's building his kingdom and not God's kingdom, right? Uh, it's sad. 
right? Uh, that you know, especially when we have people, you know, uh, people who have started a church, and then in the church there'll be a young man. He has done everything in the church for ten years, right? He has set up the chairs, done the sound and setup. He has uh, led the worship. He has started the cell group. He has done everything in the church. Now, after 10 or 15 years down the line, he says, hey, God is calling me, goes to the pastor and says, God is calling me to pioneer my own ministry. If the, if the other pastor says, no, you have to be with me, then that is a problem. Now, we cannot control people. We, we always let them go. We let them release them into the call of God that they have. Right. Right. Next one is uh, identify your launch location. Right, we talked about this. Uh, your your uh, you identify where you're going to launch, uh, the location, accessibility. Uh, uh, is it easy for people to reach by by different modes of transport? Then you also look at uh, a clean place, right? A suitable place. Uh, now, especially if you're reaching out to corporate sectors. Okay, this is again very. It's a practical thing, but it's important, right? Now, initially, you you start off. You start off small. You can start in a house, but then you know, okay, I've got people from the corporate sector joining the church. So, what is it? The place should be a nice place, right? Nobody who's in the in a, in a corporate organization will want to, you know, come to a place where there's, you know, at least there should be light. It should be clean. It should be neat. Um, you know, a proper facility should be there. Basic, basic things, restrooms, parking, car parking. You know, okay, they all have cars. They all have vehicles. We have to make it available. It's not like God, uh, you pray and ask God for parking. We can't do that, right? We have to make sure that all of this is available. Now, one of the things that we do in Bangalore is if in case we move our location to another place, the first question, we ask the people that we are renting out the place is, is there car parking? Because there are so many vehicles, car and bike parking. Right now, if you've got 500 people coming to church, you can't expect them to park the car on the road. There has to be a parking facility. Right now, I'm, I'm talking about now, right now. right. But in the initial phase, it's all right. right? You maybe got two, three cars and a few bikes. But as you grow, these are things that we must think of. You must have restrooms. You must have uh, you know, later on, uh, you know, as the church grows, we also need to think about children. Can't have all the children inside in the main hall, right? You need to have another children's service, so you need another hall for that. So later on, you'll need, uh, you know, as the church is growing, you need new equipment. You need new, uh, you know, you learn in media and technology as well. In the course, uh, new equipment. You'll need new uh, speakers, new. Uh, good musicians, good teams to, uh, you know, in a practical standpoint, uh, uh, you need a larger space, right? If 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 we want to get good at what we are doing, we cannot be at the same level, right? Uh, just look at, uh, you know, uh, maybe what you can do is you go back, if you go to our church website or go to YouTube, go back to 2012, 2013 worship, uh, our, our Sunday services and look at the Sunday services now there's such a big difference why because as we grow as we're getting better as technology improves we have to uh, you know provide good you know good service to our to the people who are coming Right. They are coming, they're taking time, they're coming for the service. Yes, they're coming to meet God. Uh, they're coming to experience the presence of God. Uh, but make sure that they also have a comfortable time. Right. Let me give you this example. In one of our locations, that is our east location, uh, east of Bangalore, um, you know, we were, we were renting out a hotel every week. Uh, so we had about 60, 70 of us in, at this location and what happened was the ac work had stopped uh, the, sorry the ac stopped working right and so what we tried to do is many of them said hey well, we need to continue our services but then uh, since it's a hotel it's it's completely closed right it's double glass paint on the sides uh, and so 
we we bought these uh, fans, right? These standing fans. We thought, okay, we'll use them. But even after using them for a couple of, I think it was about five, six Sundays, we realized that, you know, every time I preach and I, I saw that there were elderly people, they were struggling to breathe inside, they were sweating, um, the air itself was hot. Now, now I, I thought to myself, I mean, they, these are, you know, there are young people, there are children, there, there are older folks as well, and they're coming here, but it's hard for them. So we, we stopped the service for a while. We said, okay. Uh, until we find a nice place, we'll take a break. You can attend our main service, but we'll take a break, right? Uh, and yes, it was you know it was discouraging. We had to stop, uh, but we wanted to make sure that everyone who come on Sunday are come. It's not like we're making them physically comfortable only, right? Uh, we we want them to hear the word. We want them to grow in the things of God. But this is also important. Right? So then we looked out for a nice place, a bigger space. We found a bigger space. And while finding a bigger space, number one thing we thought was there should be parking. Because many of them come in their own vehicles, there should be parking. So we got the right place. right? And even when we are renting the place, make it absolutely sure that it's a church service. Never tell the owners it's only for prayer or only once a while I'll come on Sunday and I will sing one five songs and we'll uh, you know preach the word. You can just say it's a prayer service. Be very clear. Don't hide anything. Uh, you know, make sure that the rental agreement is in place. Make sure that the lease agreement it is written on the agreement. Okay, this is what is going to happen. We're going to have worship. Praise, prayer, Bible studies, put on everything on paper. Every single thing, right? You can also mention that. So, the new place, we have mentioned the timings. We'll be here from this time to this time on Sunday. Um, and, and then we will make sure that we clean the place. Everything's on paper. So, what happens? Everything runs smoothly. The owners are not going to come and say, hey, you said you're going to be here till this time but now you're staying on for so long you said sunday uh, you know once a while there's music but every sunday i hear loud music everything's on paper they know it's a church or you wouldn't want the owner to say i didn't know it's a church i thought you were doing some bible study and some you know uh, singing uh, but now you're saying it's a church i cannot give it to a church it becomes a big problem right so be absolutely clear make sure that when we are gathering, uh, whether it's in the house, whether it's in uh, the corporate setting, we don't uh, disturb or be a trouble to any of our neighbors. Right? We, that's something that we follow. Right? We try to uh, make sure that you know we we when we gather, when we have our worship activities, life groups, uh, we don't want to be a trouble to somebody else who's next to us. Right? We want them to. We want to live in. Uh, uh, in, in, the, in the community, we want to learn the community. We want to link the gospel to the community, love the community, and we need to launch to the community. So uh, the community is important. And, uh, so I hope I'm I'm trying I'm getting the point across, right? So I don't want to sound like we are or you know we're trying to be please the church members. Yes, we. We want them to grow. We want them to come for prayer time. Now, for example, if we're having extended time of worship, three hours of worship and prayer and worship, we'd want them to come and we'd want them to be comfortable during the uh, praise and worship, but so that they can freely worship God. Right. Uh, so these are things that you know we desire to do, and we always strive to uh, you know to have our worship services seamless right so if you look at our uh, teams in a in a church service we have a service coordinator we have a meet and greet so every time somebody enters the church we have a meet and greet team then we have an ushering team ushers people in helps them to sit then we have uh, the sound and setup team media team FTV lounge, which is first time visitors. Right? So many things are involved. And we have the children's church team, teens church team, uh, different, different, many different teams. Right? So what's happening? We are, we are trying to minister to each of them. 
each uh uh you know rain each um uh, gender, each age group, everyone, Prime Minister to them, right? Now, once you launch the church, what you can do is when, when you see, okay, the church is growing, it's doing well, say, for example, you're 100 people, you've launched, and there are 100 people in the church. Even as you start the church, raise up leaders, identify and raise up leaders. So, for example, your church is 100 people, you should have at least 20 good leaders. Now, you can ask these 20 leaders, 10 of them, choose 10 of them and say, there's a place. Now, let us go towards this side of Bangalore, do some outreach and replicate everything that you did here. Pre-launch meetings, Bible study groups, worship. Think of your target audience. This is a core team, pray together, spend time together, minister together, and then launch. So you again, you repeat the whole cycle. But then the, you got to be led by the Holy Spirit. OK, where do I have to go? Where can I? Who are the people that I should choose? Right? And then you choose them. And especially as a leader, you can go with them initially. And then train them, help them to, you know, uh, uh, and like basically train them, teach them, and then send them out. Uh, and then they can charge, start another church plant. And again, you give them time. It could be a year, it could be six months, a year, or even more. Uh, but then you have, you see your vision. It's not only one, one place. You have the city. So you know, okay, one day we're going to start another location here. This is what we need. So you've already got experience here. The things that you need to do, you replicate it, and then you start new locations in different places. Right. And finally, you have the house church model. Um, now, this house church model is, you know, I would say is most appropriate in towns and villages, right? Where they meet in houses and you know, spend time, and uh, they have the church service there. But if you look at it uh, in a city, uh, it's always good to you know have a place, hire a place, or have your own place, and conduct your Sunday services there. Because uh, if there are fifty people, you can't have them at home, right? Uh, it's it's obvious you have to move out. So it's always good to have your own place. There's so much more that we can do when we have our own space, right? So this is really interesting, the preparation phase. It's exciting to be in this phase, right? Uh, where you know that God is preparing you to launch. Uh, but again, uh, it, it's very important that we spend time in God's presence during this phase, choose the right people, choose the right place, uh, and, and make sure that you're doing what God is asking you to do. And uh, so it's exciting, right, this preparation phase. So next. We look at the launch phase. Once you launch, what 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 must we do? So we look at that uh, next week, All right? All right. Thank you so much. Any questions? Any thoughts before we close? I hope everyone is able to track along. Uh, but feel free if you have questions, you can always ask, uh, and you can even email me or you can post the questions. We can uh, answer them next class, right? All right, thank you so much. Have a great week ahead. God bless.